We're here today with Vamsi Vakulabaranam, who is a professor of economics at the University of Hyderabad in India. Um, and he's also one of our grantees for a very interesting project um, that I've, I've just been looking at called Development and Inequality, What Can the Asian Experience Teach Us? Um, Vamsi, welcome. Thank you. And, you know, what, what it seems to me is what you're, the puzzle you start out with, okay, is in fact the variety of Asian uh, development experience, particularly with respect to inequality. Um, can, you, can you tell us that, that this, the East Asian case is quite different from the Indian and Chinese case, is that right? Right. So that's so the puzzle. That is the puzzle. And the reason this is a puzzle is because of this Kuznets curve well, idea. Kuznets uh, made this uh, uh, argument that, you know, in the early stages of growth, uh, you know, uh, and he was looking at Western countries primarily, uh, uh, you know, inequality tends to rise. And then a point is reached when, you know, inequality begins to uh, decline. Uh, so, you know, he proposed an inverted U kind of, uh, you know, relationship between economic development and inequality, uh, looking at the Western experience. And so, what, what was the mechanism? Well, there were, uh, you know, uh, a lot of different mechanisms that uh, Kuznets talked about. One of them is, you know, uh, how, uh, uh, you know, the, the groups that migrate from you know agricultural uh, sector to modern industrial sector how uh, you know how do they gain in the process of migration right uh, if these groups uh, gain a lot more than you know the losses that uh, you know uh, the relative losses that you know the rural the population people who stay faces, behind who stay behind I you see. know so so, uh, so that's that the would... main mechanism the second mechanism that he talks about is uh, the thinning of the elites in the us you know, uh, he was looking at, you know, the elite composition in 1870s and then what happened to elites, uh, you know, uh, uh, five, six decades later. And his argument is that there was a lot of influx into the elite and, you know, it was not the, uh, the composition was very different. So the elites so this were thinning. Is about social mobility. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It, with development. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, and so is this the, so this Kuznets curve regularity you're saying seems to be holding for China and India and is it for those mechanisms? Uh, I don't think so. You know, okay, this is so where, you're going to uh, study that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. This is where, you know, uh, I'm going to use my INET grant uh, and I'm, I'm proposing something slightly different. Uh, my argument is basically that, uh, you know, inequality is driven by uh, uh, changes in inequality are driven by, uh, you know, changes in what I call as the regimes of capitalism. Uh, you know, there regimes are, of capitalism. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so what's that? Uh, a regime of capitalism is, you know, uh, if you want to look at it, you know, what's the relationship between the working class and the capitalist class? What's the uh, uh, particular uh, relationship between markets and state? Uh, uh, you know, what are the behavioral norms? You know, what is expected of people? You know, a combination of these. So this is a kind of institutional um, or a collection of institutions, interlocking institutions is what you mean. Here. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, just to give you, you know, just to flesh this out, you know, just to give you a couple of examples, uh, you know, after uh, Great Depression, you know, when there was a, a serious shortage of effective demand, uh, that's how Keynes at least, you know, uh, uh, thought about it. Uh, you know, you, you saw, you know, uh, especially the Western world, uh, you know, implementing uh, a, a, an institutional structure uh, that would uh, help uh, bolster the aggregate demand in the economy. Uh, you know, a welfare state was set up. The New you know, Deal. The New Deal, you know, mm -hmm. post Roosevelt, you know, but uh, Keynesian policies are more explicitly, mm -hmm. uh, you know, brought in in various, uh, you know, uh, countries in the West. And uh, uh, apart from welfare state, the unions were strong, collective bargaining arrangements were strong, uh, and, uh, you know, the workers' fallback improved significantly. Uh, during that period. So that's one kind of regime where, you know, uh, uh, you, know you, you, uh, you see that, you know, gains from growth are shared somewhat equally, uh, you know, across different sections of society. So let's return now to the puzzle. So yeah. the puzzle is that East Asian experience is different from the Indian and Chinese experience. And this has something to do with this regime idea? Exactly, exactly. So my argument is, uh, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, you know, some of the East Asian countries that grew rapidly between 1950s and 1970s, uh, you know, they grew rapidly with an interventionist state, with a welfare state, with a developmental state, 
you know, which implemented land reforms, which equalized, you know, the rural population. And, and it was in a broader Keynesian global environment. You, know, you had the Bretton Woods institutions in place, you know, fixed exchange rates, you know, the terms of trade were favorable to these countries. But in the case of India and China, they start growing in a very different global regime. You uh, see the emergence of neoliberalism, you see the destruction of the welfare state, you see a new regime where, you know, capital is footloose, it's uh, traveling across the world, you know, it has much greater mobility. Uh, accumulation strategies change very significantly. It's, it, you know, there are three strategies. One is, you know, to attack workers, you know, reduce wages and increase profits. The other thing is, you know, uh, you, you also accumulate through disposition, you know, uh, you, you transfer resources from public to private, you transfer resources from commons to private uh, hands. Uh, you also, you know, see uh, an accumulation process through speculation. Right, uh, uh, the whole financial capital, you know, financialization experience. And so all three of these things are happening in India and China, which uh, explains why inequality increases. Exactly. This is so, the idea. Yeah. In okay. fact, what I'm arguing is that, uh, you know, the deeper regime that's at work in global, in the global economy, in global capitalism, uh, that is what drives inequality dynamics in various countries. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, within country inequality dynamics are driven by the kind of regime you have at the global level. Well, this is this is a very big picture, very big think sort of project here. Um, wh where does this come from in your own in your own life? You started as a con doing computer science, isn't that right? Yes. As an undergraduate. Yes. And how did you get from there to here? After my engineering degree in computer science, uh, I went on to do an MBA, and after my MBA in know, India, I, in India, mm -hmm. and then I worked for Unilever uh, in India, uh, you know, in 1994. In fact, on day one, I think the switch happened. You know, on day one, you know, the, the vice president of human resources uh, came and talked to us and he said, you know, the greatest success of the HR department is uh, to break the backbone of the trade union uh, in the corporation. So I was the only one who raised uh, my hand and said, well, you know, are, aren't workers part of the corporation? Uh, and, you know, uh, everybody looked at me strangely, so I knew I was in the wrong place. Mm. So then I started looking for things, you know, uh, uh, where, you know, I could, uh, uh, you know, carry my curiosity further. And uh, that's how I ended up at University of Massachusetts Amherst. And uh, where, you know, uh, economics is taught in a slightly heterodox way. Uh, and that's, that's what brought me to some of these bigger questions. Yeah. And when you say you were started to pursue your curiosity, so you were reading on your own. Yes. So what did you read? Well, you know, initially, uh, uh, I didn't read economics. Uh, I was uh, reading uh, sociology books, you know, uh, this huge book by Anthony Giddens. It's called Sociology. And uh, uh, my, uh, you know, my family is a unique family. We are a uh, family of academicians. So my father is a historian. My brother is a historian. My mother is a political scientist. So there was no shortage of intellectual resources at home. And they also gave me, you know, some pointers to, uh, you know, economics books. And so I picked up, you know, Robert Heilbronner's Worldly Philosophers, uh, mm -hmm. James, uh, John uh, Kenneth Galbraith's, you know, History of Economics. So I started reading some of these uh, accounts and, you know, that's how the interest grew. Then you came all the way to UMass Amherst. Yes. And you did your PhD. Um, and uh, I'm interested, so you taught for a while in the United States. And then you went back to the University of Hyderabad, where you are now. Yes. What is what is it different teaching in the United States in New York? It was Queens College, yeah. right? Um, what do you see as the similarities and differences in teaching the kind of students that you have? Uh, at Queens College, you know, you get a lot of immigrants, uh, you know, children of immigrants who you know uh, are looking for social mobility, right? So they may be interested in the deeper issues, the larger issues, uh, but eventually they want to get make a career. Uh, whereas, you know, in, in uh, University of Hyderabad, uh, you know, that's not the primary focus. You know, a lot of students want to go into higher studies. So they're interested in some of the deeper questions. So uh, at some level, you know, I think the intellectual content of, uh, you know, teaching in uh, Hyderabad is deeper. But both were interesting. You know. mm -hmm. So you're, you're part of our attempt to build a global network of, of new economists. And so I'm really pleased to talk to you today and, and learn about your work and wish you, wish you really great success. And we look forward to hearing the results of that. And, Thank you, Peri. And meanwhile, welcome to our stable of INET economists. Thank you. Thank you very much.